Money is property that amplifies speech. But that money isn't speech itself. So whereas you never want to regulate you know, the content of political speech, in order to keep the principle of one person, one vote, one voice, regulating the amount with which someone can contribute to a candidate is reasonable in a free society. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk. I'm your host. Today our guest is Evan Preston. Evan is a fellow with Osberg. Osberg is the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group, which is part of a federation of statesburgs. Uh, so um, we want to talk about money in politics, the, uh, what the last election showed us, how that interacts us with the Citizens United uh, decision and questions like that. Uh, Osberg recently published actually a, 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 a post-election report uh, which followed up on a report that happened before the election, which was called uh, Millions, what, what was it called? Millions? Yeah, Million Dollar Megaphones. Which Million can, Dollar Megaphones, Yep, okay. can be found on our website, osperg.org, under okay. our reports. Yep. Okay, yeah, and you did that report with, uh, with another organization called Demos. Yes, it's called Demos, a think tank, yep. Okay, all right, any more detail about what Demos is? Sure, so they, they do other work around this about um, uh, sort of transparency and uh, increasing access to our democracy, as as uh, Osberg does, oh, and it's a national organization. Uh, yes, it's it's based on the East Coast. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. And just real briefly, Osberg. What's Osberg? Sure. So Osberg, the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group, has is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that's been working in Oregon for social change for 41 years. Um, so founded in 1971 at the University of Oregon. It was a way for originally college students to realize the social change they wanted to see, but they realized they needed to have advocates outside of the campus to achieve that. So they started pooling their resources and uh, hiring people such as lawyers or advocates, uh, associates like myself, to advocate for them in the state house and at the federal level. Mm -hmm. All right, yes, and then I, I actually went to Portland State in 1971, and I remember when Osprey was, was first founded, and it was like, all right, this, is, this, was a, this was kind of an exciting moment. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, uh, so this report that uh, uh, Osprey and Demos uh, released, give us some feel for what that report said. Sure, so what we saw clearly was that Big money donors were able to drown out the voices of ordinary people giving small amounts to political candidates and to causes they believe in. So this fundamentally undermines our democracy in that when big money sources can drown out what ordinary people want to hear in their elections, they can set the agenda and completely distort the process of our, of our democracy. Mm -hmm. So one example of this is that 61 large donors to super PACs giving about an average of $4.7 million were able to equal every single small contributor to the presidential campaigns. So that's mm -hmm. over 1.4 million people. That means that those 61 big donors had a voice 23,000 times the size of a normal person. Wow, that totally undermines the concept of one 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 person, one vote. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. And um, we hear a lot of discussion about various kinds of groups, and I wondered if you could just take a minute to talk about some of the various kinds of the super PACs and the and the 501c4s and the six sixes and those kinds of things, just so we have a, a grounding. Sure. So the, the biggest change since 2010 was the creation of these things called super PACs. Um, so previously, you had a political action committee, and uh, you could give money to it. What the Citizens United decision did was create these unlimited independent expenditure bodies, the super PACs, which can receive money from really any source. So what we've seen happen is that you can have money funneled through another organization, which is a 501c4, um, and these can be labeled as, you know, social welfare organizations that are, you know, normally these are charities and, and other kinds of things, but they can effectively hide where the money is coming from to super PACs. And we've seen a significant perc percentage of super PAC funding come from secret sources that don't have to disclose donors. So those are sort of the two 
big uh, areas of concern are super PACs that uh, contribute the, the largest amount of outside spending, and then 501c4s that you can really hide where the original source of that money is. Okay, all right. And, and the difference between PACs prior to 2010 and super PACs, what's the major difference is there? Right, so now with, with a super PAC, you're not constrained to the same expenditure limits, um, and also you can, it, it just really broadens your ability to, to raise funds. So that's why we've seen the, f the spending in this election skyrocket from previous levels. I mean, it had been increasing uh, over the course of you know, the last 12 years, but we've seen it go really through the roof after 2010. Okay, yeah, and I read very recently that both the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign both spent more than a billion dollars on their, on their respective campaigns. Yeah, and that's just the candidates spending themselves. When you take into account, you know, so between them, the two of them, right, about $2 billion, a little bit more than that. But, you know, over the entire election process, we saw around in the neighborhood of $6 billion spent. That's because of the increase in outside spending that Citizens United allowed, in which people are not even giving to the candidates they want to see elected. They're giving to other organizations, and these are big donors giving to these other organizations to hide where it's really coming from. Okay. And, and just for folks that may be watching that don't know what Citizens United is. Sure. So Citizens United uh, was a Supreme Court ruling in January of 2010 um, that eliminated the McCain-Feingold regime of campaign finance, really, uh, and it allowed for the unlimited expenditure of funds by so-called independent, non-coordinated bodies. So theoretically, these super PACs are not able to coordinate with a candidate. Um, however, what we've seen is that staffers, top staffers from campaigns of both major parties will leave the campaigns clearly imbued with the sense of what the campaign needs to do, and then we'll go off to run these committees, and you could so even- So-called independent so committees. So-called independent right. committees. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the crux of Anth uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy's argument in, in, the, in his opinion, which would have been the decisive vote, was that they would be truly independent, and that voters would be able to see where the money was coming from in doing this, and so it would be a transparent, independent process. We've seen that neither of those things have proven to be true in the last two elections. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Can you give us some other ideas about um, levels of spending from various groups? Sure, sure. So the, the biggest source of, of, of spending that comes to the, the super PACs, for example, are from wealthy individuals. And the, the truly troubling part about this is that there is widespread bipartisan support for stopping this kind of thing. 84% of Americans, so that should tell you how bipartisan that opinion is. 84% mm -hmm. of Americans believe that unlimited incorporated bodies spending this kind of money, so unlimited corporation spending, damages our democracy. If 84% of Americans in 2012 can agree about anything, that should be pretty remarkable and mm -hmm. taken seriously in the political climate. Despite this fact, this has been you know, disregarded by Know, august bodies as wide ranging as the Economist to, um, to you know the, the Wall Street Journal. Um, so we we see that there is a lot of support among people for stopping the unlimited corporate spending. Um, you know, just the uh, in the past couple of weeks, I've spent time talking to conservative leaders throughout the state, and there's a real openness to addressing this issue because no matter what your political ideology is, you want to be able to have your voice heard regardless of the amount of resources that you may have. And your ideas should be able to win in an election if they're thought to be better ideas than your, your opposition. Mm -hmm. That's not entirely possible with unlimited spending. And so this is the dialogue that we've seen come up. Um, because the major sources of this outside spending are wealthy corporated bodies, so mostly corporations but also unions, and wealthy individuals giving. Okay, yeah, and, and this, um, on, on your report, uh, this is the follow-up mm -hmm. post-election report, there's a chart here and it shows the amount which unions give, and unions are 501c5s, and it's just this tiniest, tiny little sliver that unions have given compared to the, the other bodies that, that give. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of that is, is, is a little bit masked because 
labor can give to super PACs also, and so those are counted separately in that. And we did see that there were pro-labor super PACs, but you're right. Um, uh, the, by far in, in, our, in our research, you know, the, the spending is not coming directly from unions or, um, or from, you know, trade, trade bodies like that. It's, it's coming from the, the outside spending is coming from super PACs. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, so there's been um, a, a lot of discussion about dark money in mm -hmm. the in the el election campaign. Sure. So uh, define dark money and how does that work? Sure. So dark money is uh, campaign contributions that cannot be traced to their original source. So a major way to do this is how I mentioned before through 501c4s, um, usually you know charitable designations, um, social welfare. You can, anyone can set up a 501c4 for the purpose of, of this and effectively launder the money that's going towards either a super PAC or a campaign, and you can't trace to where it, uh, its original source is. Um, and, and that's because there's just no legal requirements? Correct. There's no legal requirement of okay. disclosure, even to the Federal Election Commission. So, okay. um, But the second part of the dark money and what's unknown in the political process is that the window for disclosure to the FEC is extraordinarily limited given the modern political climate in which we had, what did we campaign for 18 months mm -hmm. for the, the previous presidential cycle. Um, there's only a small window in which the disclosure has to happen, even under the current rules of disclosure, which we think are too limited. But, so we need to do two things. The, the, the FEC could expand their disclosure window to c encapsulate the real amount of time that the media spends talking about the presidential race and other races down ballot. Um, and that's the first step we should take. The second step we should take is take the SEC could simply issue an executive ruling that publicly traded companies must disclose when they give to uh, trade bodies to, um, you know, you're traded on public markets, so in exchange for that, it should be open to the public what kinds of political contributions you're giving to organizations such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, there's widespread support for that among uh, smaller businesses. Um, so those are the, the two areas of dark money that we see, both the limits on disclosure that's, that are captured even in the campaign window, and then the diminished size of the campaign window. Right. Yeah. So, so we need we we need to require that those hidden donors be exposed to the light, uh, and then we need to increase the the window in which the reporting is required to actually cover the the what is in reality now. An almost endless campaign, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I I think there are some nations that actually have limits in terms of how long campaigns can be. Yeah. Yeah. Britain. Britain, for example, has extraordinarily limited uh, amount of time that you can spend campaigning, and it's it's different because it's a parliamentary system that they mm -hmm. have. But but yes, we we are we are a somewhat right. somewhat uh, yeah. unique. I, I I would assume that uh, major media would be really upset if we did put limits on it because they would. Uh, cut into their uh, profit margins. Right. Uh, uh, um, selling media for campaigns is a major source of, of their revenue. Right. Yeah. So, um, in th in this follow-up uh, post-election uh, report, uh, there are some um, specific re uh, policy requirements. Yes. Uh, do you want to talk about some of those specific? Yeah. Sure. So, you know, we would, in terms of recommendations uh, for going forward, what we should do. The first thing we have to address is that there is a precedent that's been purported by the Supreme Court dating back to 1976 in a decision called Buckley v. Vallejo that effectively money equals speech, that campaign contributions are that money is speech. What we believe and what we've argued in the report with, with Demos is that money is property that amplifies speech, but that money isn't speech itself. So whereas you never want to regulate you know, the content of political speech, in order to keep the principle of one person, one vote, one voice, regulating the amount with which someone can contribute to a candidate is reasonable in a free society. 
you know, elections are how we determine the rules that we're going to live under and how we, we decide that we're going to live together. And the rules for then running elections are one of the most fundamental aspects of how you maintain a free society. So that's, that's the, the first recommendation. Um, but this, secondly, I would, I would move toward the idea that you know, we have to see this in a truly bipartisan nature. So this is not something that you want to have changed by simply the majority party of what a particular state legislature um, or in Congress. So we would not want to see this you know, changed ad in, in the, the Oregon State Legislature simply by Democrats, and you wouldn't want to see this written in Washington in the House simply by Republicans. Mm -hmm. This is something that has bride, widespread, broad based of support across partisan lines, and we have every reason now to move forward with common sense regulations of spending and disclosure. So limits on spending, attacking the idea of Buckley v. Vallejo, then rigorous transparency in terms of disclosure of publicly traded companies, who they're giving to, and their trade associations. And then, uh, so the same thing for the dark money that I mentioned before. Um, disclosing, having to disclose big donors. And finally, the real thing that makes the whole system work eventually is to have um, publicly matching funds for small contributors. So Osperg backed something in the Portland area called voter-owned elections. Um, and part of this, um, uh, that, that's a, it's a little bit d different of a thing, but it, to suggest things that we've done in the past, um, part of what really increases the ability for ordinary people to have a political voice is when you can have matching funds, um, so you know, publicly assessed funds that candidates can receive once they demonstrate from a petition that they have a wide bra base of support from the public. So, there's an example of this. Uh, you know, Arizona's campaign finance regime was a, a pretty, pretty good example of this before um, it was changed. But um, when you allow that, what we saw actually uh, in 1994, Osberg backed something called Measure 9, um, which was the most substantial campaign finance regime uh, that, that Oregon had seen um, to that, that point. Mm -hmm. And so it set limits on direct contributions to campaigns, and as, as well as, uh, you know, uh, capping contributions to PACs, then were, were no super PACs at the time. Um, the result of those kinds of changes in the one election that was held under those, those rules was that overall spending on the campaigns went down by 67 percent, but citizen participation, so the amount of people contributing, went up by 33 mm. percent. So we see that if we move forward with these kinds of recommendations, we have more people engaged in the political process having their voice heard, and a diminished ability for bigger interests to simply pile money into forward their, their narrow interests. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, one of the um, um, reports that I saw with reference to Portland's public funding of elections was, the, was a, a distribution map, and it showed that prior to that, the, the uh, contributions that were received for for city political campaigns were concentrated in certain office buildings downtown. Sure. Uh, but when you had public funding, uh, then uh, the folks that gave the $5 contributions to allow those candidates to receive the funding were dis dis distributed widely throughout the metropolitan area, which is really where we want to be. Exactly, so exactly. Because if, if we are all political equals, we, we believe in the principle of one person, one vote, then we need to have that kind of engagement and the ability for people to be engaged in an equitable way. So, you know, this this is true in Oregon. I've spoken to uh, you know conservative leaders who are not necessarily from the metropolitan area of Portland. It's very difficult to run for a statewide office if you don't have the access to those handful of mm -hmm. buildings in downtown Portland mm -hmm. that can funnel a lot of cash to a campaign. Mm -hmm. Which um, is why all of our statewide elected officials are all from the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Um, so yeah, so it, it, again, this, this really, these changes increase our, our, our small d democracy in every way possible. That for no matter if you're liberal or conservative, um, if, if you don't have the resources or are located in the right media markets to have an outsized political voice, then you're hurt by the current system. And that's why we need to change it. Mm -hmm. right. And there, there, are, there is a s specific, uh, and I think it's in Congress now for providing funds for, for national elections. 
uh, that would provide not just a one-to-one -one match, but would give, um, uh, and maybe you know the details. Hopefully you know the details mm -hmm. more than I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Well, well, yeah, and, and I think that, though, the something to, to dwell on with this is that certainly a constitutional amendment that would address the principle of Buckley v. Vallejo or the court reconsidering its opinion um, and, and, and reasoning since then would be an immediate step. But right now, we can mobilize voters around, you know, 76 percent of the public believes that publicly traded companies should have to disclose their political giving. That's something that can be done immediately by the SEC and, and in coordination with the FEC. But you know, it hasn't been done surely because of the limited special interest that is pushing hard for this in Washington and in state capitals across the country like Salem. So that's something we could do today, um, <laughs> regardless of whatever else is happening in Congress. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and regarding a constitutional amendment to, to get around um, Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United and First Bank versus Bellotti, those decisions that said money is, money is speech. Uh, a constitutional amendment is widely supported. I think you said earlier 84 percent of, of the population supports doing something like that? Right. 84 percent of the population believes that unlimited corporate spending drowns out the voice of ordinary people. Okay. All right. And uh, that question made it to the ballot actually uh, across the nation in, in a lot of locations. Can you give us a summary of that? Yes, it did. That? Sure. So to start here in Oregon, um, four major places, and I know that you know because the Alliance for Democracy <laughs> is uh, very involved with this and that's fantastic. Four major places in Oregon on November 6th took action on this in Ashland, in Lincoln County, um, in Eugene, and in Corvallis. Voters by upwards of 70 percent percent in each of those constituencies supported the idea that money is not speech and that corporations are not people. Um, and, and that we need to amend the Constitution. To amend the Constitution to address this, yes. So, yeah, and this is part of a nationwide movement. Um, those voters in Oregon were joined by voters in the deeply red state of Montana um, that went in the presidential election heavily for Mitt Romney also voted 75 percent to 25 percent to uh, amend the Constitution um, to reflect that corporations are not people and to mm -hmm. limit c unlimited campaign spending. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Colorado, we saw a similar measure also passed statewide with vast supermajority support. So small towns in Ohio supported this, towns in Massachusetts, you know, from both red and blue parts of the country, this, this is really growing nationally. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely, this is part of you know, a, a surge of support of people. But it's going to take the work to actually organize you know, voters around this idea and realize that they can change it. This mm -hmm. is our political process, and we have the power to change it. Right, yes. I, yeah, absolutely. And, and a couple other places of you note, know, Chicago itself ha had it on the ballot, and then a bunch of communities around Chicago, all of them passed mm -hmm. um, over 70% of the vote. Uh, you mentioned Massachusetts. Uh, I think a third of the population in Massachusetts had the opportunity to vote on this kind of question, and overwhelmingly in all of those, uh, it was approved. I think I, I saw a, a uh, summary of that, that 72 percent on average approved of, of amending the Constitution. And then a number of state legislatures have uh, suggested that they would, uh, would approve uh, or want to have the Constitution to be amended to do this as well. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, very good. So, that's our time. Great. Thank you very much for being here, Evan. Great. Thank you. Great. You bet. Yeah, so we've been talking with Evan Preston, who is a fellow with Osberg, uh, the Oregon State Public Interest Research Group. And so that concludes our program for today. We do have a couple of things coming up in Portland, uh, which uh, Portlanders can be involved with. Uh, first of all, on January 10th, Multnomah County commissioners uh, will consider a resolution calling for the Oregon congressional delegation to support amending the U.S. Constitution to eliminate corporate personhood, as well as the doctrine that money is speech. So exactly what we've been talking about here today. So if you can plan on attending this uh, hearing, that would be wonderful. So that is January 10th. The hearing and the vote will be at the Multnomah County Commission Chambers at 501 Southeast Hawthorne here in Portland, and the session itself starts at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, the Alliance for Democracy has also been instrumental in forming a coalition of groups to support passage by the Oregon State Legislature, 
legislature of a similar kind of resolution in their upcoming 2013 uh, session. Uh, coalition members include the Alliance for Democracy, all of them move to amend Oregon uh, affiliates, Oregon Common Cause, Oregon Rural Organizing Project, and the Oregon Main Street Alliance. Uh, your help in visiting with Oregon representatives and senators to build support for this is, uh, is called for. Uh, and if you visit the coalition website at OregonRestoresDemocracy.org, uh, you can learn more about this effort and how you can plug into this effort to visit your representatives and senators. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. We are now on YouTube. Go to YouTube.com, search for Populist Dialogues. Uh, select, the, uh, select the option there with the Statue of Liberty icon. Uh, to view all of our shows of this past year and to subscribe for future shows. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. I uh, want to thank our crew today, Joan Horton, Dave King, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, and Tom Thomas for getting us on the air again. And thank you, audience, for watching. Uh, we'll, I hope that we'll see you again next week. So long.